Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Wow, what a morning it is this morning. And how about Ryan Robeson on the worship music with Kings and Queens? We are so blessed to have him leading our worship here in, in Charleston. And how about a quick round of applause for everybody that played any role in getting this sanctuary ready for this morning? <laughs> countless hours, countless hours, but every one of them was worth it. Amen. You know, as I was praying for God to give me the words to speak here this morning, uh, he asked me a question and he said, what is in your basket? God asks me questions like that all the time and usually takes me days of praying on that to figure out exactly what he's asking me because I'm a little bit slow sometimes. So I was praying for God, what do you mean what's in my basket? He took me to a very popular and well-read story in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. It's when Jesus feeds 5,000 people. We're going to read that story here this morning and then we're going to talk about it. Because you and I were in that story, believe it or not. John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all of these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them all and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And as God took me through that scripture, the first thing that stuck out to me and the first point in that scripture where God paused me was in the second verse where it says a great crowd had followed Jesus because they had seen what he had been doing. And then God showed me our own lives. And as believers, we have people following us. We have people looking at us. You have people looking at you because people around you know that you have Christ. It's nothing you've done. There's nothing special about you. There's nothing special about me. The reason that people look at you and the reason that people come to you is because you have Jesus Christ. And these people knew the miracles that Christ had been working. They knew that he had healed lame people. They knew that he had given vision to people that could not see. They knew that he had raised dead people to life and they wanted to know about Jesus. They wanted to meet him, they wanted to see him. They wanted to know what he was all about. You see, every one of you has someone in your life that wants to see Jesus Christ and they are watching the way you are living your life. They're watching the way you treat people. They're watching the way you treat your spouse, your kids, your neighbor. They are watching the way you love people because they want to know about the Christ that you carry with you. They want to know about this Jesus Christ that you worship. John chapter 14 verse 20 says, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. You are in Jesus Christ. Christ is in you. When you go about your everyday life, you are carrying Jesus Christ with you. You are representing the Savior of the world, and people are watching the way you're acting. They want to come. They want to see what's going on. And just like that crowd in John chapter 6 had came to see Jesus Christ, we are surrounded with people 
when you go to work, when you go to the store, when you live life, you are surrounded by a crowd of people that wants what you have. They want the same Jesus Christ that you have. And then Christ took me back to the story in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. When Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all of these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it will take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <clears throat> Christ saw the crowd coming to them, and he immediately knew that the crowd was hungry. He knew that. He knew that they were hungry and needed something to eat. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 33, verse 13 says, from heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. Jesus Christ sees you. Just like he saw the crowd in John chapter 6, he sees you and he sees the other people that are coming to see him as well. But Jesus didn't just see them, he immediately knew what they needed. You see, when Christ looks down on you, when God looks down on you, he not only sees you, he knows what you need and he wants to give it to you. Just like he asked Philip, how are we going to feed these people? That is what he's asking you when you have crowds coming to you. How are you going to feed these people, Don? Matt, how are you going to feed these people? Tom, how are you going to feed these people? He's asking you the same question that he asked Philip in John chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 verses 21 says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who weep now, for you shall laugh. Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The people that came to Christ in that story in John chapter 6 were hungry for righteousness. And the people in your life that don't know Jesus Christ yet, that are watching you, are hungry for the exact same thing. The question that Christ is asking you right here this morning is how are you going to feed those people? We read Philip's response. It's astounding. Philip, this is how Philip answers the Savior of the world. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. You see, Philip did not understand yet that Jesus Christ could do anything. When Jesus asked Philip, how are we going to feed these people? He still thought that he had to do it himself. And God started showing me the people in our lives. And all of the times that we answer him just like Philip did. The alcoholic in your life, the drug addict, the adulterer, the liar, the thief. Christ is asking you to spiritually feed those people. But we answer the same way Philip did. God, that's going to take too much time. He's too broken. It's going to take too much money. It's going to take too much of an investment for me to feed that person. They're too far gone, Lord. They're too hungry. There's no possible way I can do that because we think he's asking us to fix them. That's not what he's asking at all, church. He is sitting right beside you just like he was sitting right beside Philip. John chapter 6, verse 35 says, Jesus says to them, now listen to this, guys, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You see, when God sends us people that are spiritually hungry, we get overwhelmed because we think we have to fix them. We are incapable of fixing someone. We cannot do it. But the Jesus Christ that you carry with you, he can. He tells us right there he's the bread of life. All you have to do is get those people to the bread. You got to get them people to the spiritual food is what we have to do. That's our role. Our role isn't to tell them how bad they are. Our role is not to remind them of their sin. We all have sin. Shame on us for acting like we don't. Our job when spiritually hungry people come to us is to connect them to the bread of life. And scripture tells us that is Jesus Christ. But we don't. We act just like Philip acts act like. Matter of fact, sometimes we act worse than Philip. We act like we don't even see the crowd. That guy that's addicted to drugs at your workplace, you pretend like you don't know he has a problem. Amen. That guy who's having an affair on his wife, you act like you don't see the issue. 
The lady that's an alcoholic, you pretend like you don't even know her problems because we don't think we have what it takes to feed them. And guess what? We don't. But Jesus Christ does. And it's time we stop being lazy and it's time we start taking people's hands and connecting them with the bread of life. You see, when we think we have to do it all ourselves and we get overwhelmed, we lose the opportunity to introduce people to the Savior. It's an opportunity lost. When Christ sends someone into your life that's battling sin or addiction, he's asking you the same question he asked Philip. How are you going to feed these people? The question is, are we answering the same way Philip did? We make it too complicated. We prolong introducing people to the Savior. But when we remember John 14, chapter 20, it says, on that day you will realize I'm in my Father, you are in me and I am you. We remember that Jesus Christ is in us. He wants to do his work through you. All we have to do is arrange the meeting church and he will do the rest. John chapter 21 Verses 15 through 17 says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus kept asking him. He asked him a third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said one last time, feed my sheep. We love Christ. You love Jesus. I love Jesus. We all love Jesus. And he is telling us the same thing that he says right here to Peter. Feed my sheep. That's not a question. He's not, he's not asking you, do you want to? He is telling us all this morning. He's telling all believers this morning, feed my sheep. How do we do that? How do we feed them? Sometimes it's overwhelming. There's a lot of people in this town There's a lot of people in this county. There's a lot of people in this state. There are a lot of people around the globe that need fed spiritually, and it becomes overwhelming. But we don't need to make it any more complicated than it needs to be. We find our answer in Scripture. Back in the Scripture we've already read this morning, John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We feed the people by connecting them with Christ. It's simple. It is literally that simple. Listen, and you don't have to tell your coworker, hey, I know you're stuck in sin. We're going to go through every day and read the Bible until we go cover to cover. That's not, you don't need to do that. There's no reason to make it weird. Feed them. Introduce them to Jesus by living your life. Introduce them to Christ by loving them just like Jesus tells us to love people. That's how you introduce them to Christ because then they start to ask you, how how can you love me when you know I'm addicted to drugs, right? At first, it's gonna be weird. They're gonna think this is strange because they've never been loved like that. They've never experienced the love of Christ because we have not been doing our jobs in feeding these people. It's our fault. God, forgive us, it's our fault. We go back to the story in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 8 through 9 says, Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? I think about that story a huge crowd of people. A young boy with a basket with five small loaves of bread and two small fish. A small boy with a basket containing his lunch for that afternoon. A small boy with a basket that contains his only means of survival, his only means of eating that day, his only means of nourishment. At this point where he's at, it's literally all he has. 
He has that basket with bread and fish in it, and he has his clothes. That's all he's got, church. He's not walking around with his iPad. He's not walking around with his iPhone. He's got his clothes and a basket with his food in it. And the boy gave everything he had to Christ. He gave his basket to Andrew because Andrew most likely told him, Jesus Christ needs what you have. He needs your basket. So he handed it over. I like to imagine the boy smiling. I've got a young son myself, and I know how the expression on their face when they know they're making their dad proud, when they know they're making the people in their lives proud, they got a smile on their face. They're happy that they can do something to help people. It makes them feel important. It makes them feel like they have a place. And I imagine the boy with a big grin on his face handing that basket and saying, take what I have. I know Jesus needs it. Take it. And it reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It says, each of you should give what you've decided to give in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus wanted to use what that young boy had in his basket, and when they asked him to give it to him, he was happy. He did it. Scripture doesn't tell us they had to rip the basket away from the boy. Scripture doesn't tell us that the boy cried when he gave him the basket. Scripture says he just gave it, and he did it cheerfully. The young boy knew that what he had in his basket was enough. It only had five loaves and two fish, but the young boy knew that once Christ got that basket, it was going to be enough to do what Jesus wanted to do with it. He knew that Jesus could take that sparsely filled basket and feed all those people. But Andrew was older. Andrew had lived in the world much longer than that boy. The world had been rough on Andrew, just like it has been on all of us. The world had beat him up, had bruised him, and he had doubts about what that young boy had in his basket. His exact words were, how far will they go among so many? You see, Andrew, when he took that basket, he thought, that's not enough. There's 5,000 people here. There's no way that this is enough. And I think back to those people that are hungry in our lives. We know that Jesus lives in us. Scripture tells us that. We've been taught that our whole lives, and we believe it. We know it to be true. And we know that whoever comes to Christ will never be hungry because Scripture tells us that. And we've lived that. We've experienced that in our own lives. So when Jesus asks us for our basket to feed people, we start off like the young boy. We're excited. Here you go, Jesus. Take what I've got. Use me. Use my basket to feed these people. But then very quickly, our mind and Satan starts speaking to us, and we start shifting gears. And then before you know it, we're thinking like Andrew thought. We look inside that basket that we've been carrying around with us our whole life, and we say it's just not full enough. I just don't have enough in here. There's only five small loaves and two fish. There's not enough. I'm a former addict. I'm a former alcoholic. I've committed adultery in my life. I've got DUIs on my record. I've been arrested. I've been in jail. And we look in that basket full of our life and we say, there's just not enough in there. It's too empty. And because of that... We convince ourselves that the stuff we're carrying around is rotten. It's no good. Yeah, we've got food in there, but God, uh, it's been out of the refrigerator too long. It smells. It's too nasty. I can't hand this out. My basket's got mold in there. Jesus can never use me. But we must remember Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, when you look in that basket, you're thinking the same thing that Peter thought. There's just not enough in here. This is impossible. And you're right. If you're trying to do the work yourself, it is impossible. What we're called to do is to hand our basket to Christ. Get it out of your hands and get it into the Savior, the guy that can actually do something with it. Give your basket to him. You see... When you look in your basket, you're absolutely correct. It's too empty. There is not enough in there for you to help people. 
But when you give it to Christ, he makes the impossible possible. He does what Matthew chapter 19 says, the impossible becomes possible. You see, the boy's basket had food in it. It had some things in there that Jesus Christ could use to feed human beings. The necessary stuff was in there. Sure, there wasn't enough, but the basic ingredients were in there. The question this morning is, what is in your basket? Do you have love in there? Is there compassion in your basket? Is there anger in your basket? Do you have hate inside of your basket? Do you have judgment inside of your basket? Do you have kindness, compassion, love? What is in your basket? It's time that we do an inventory of our basket right now and figure out what is in there. Before we hand it to Jesus, let's look in there and start identifying the stuff that we need to get out of there and the stuff that we need to put in there. You all have something in your basket right now that Christ can use. Do you have rotten goods in there? Sure, we all do. We've all got a past. We've all lived life. We've all messed up. You've got some nasty stuff in that basket. But I guarantee you, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you've done in the past, I don't care what other people have told you in the past, I don't care what other churches have told you in the past, you have something in your basket right now that Jesus Christ can use and is asking you to give him. You see, in order to be used to our full potential, we must make sure that our baskets are full of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. You cannot hand Christ a basket full of nothing but hate and anger and expect him to use you to feed his sheep like he is asking you to do. If all you've got in there is nasty, rotten life, it's time that you start emptying that stuff out and make sure Christ has something that he can use in your basket. But then when we read back in the story, you see Andrew looked in the boy's basket. He wasn't judging his own basket. You see, Andrew didn't even offer Christ his basket. Andrew took someone else's. Hey, Chuck, give me that basket. Jesus needs that. I'm not gonna give mine up. You kidding me? My food's in there. I can't, I'm not gonna let him use me. Here, I want him to use you. I want you to give your basket up. You see, when he looked in the boy's basket, John chapter 6, 9, we remember that he said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? What Andrew was saying is what this boy has to offer is not enough. This boy's basket is too empty. You cannot possibly use this person, God. Christ, you cannot possibly use this young boy. He's, he doesn't have anything in his basket. He's too far gone. He's too much of a drunk. He's been on drugs too long. He's had too many affairs. There's no possible way that you can use this person, God. James chapter 4.12 tells us there's only one lawgiver and one judge. The one who's able to save and destroy, but you, who, who are you to judge your neighbor? Isaiah chapter 55 verse 9 says, if the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, it does not matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your neighbor think. It doesn't matter what the pastor at your church thinks. It matters what Jesus Christ thinks. That's all that matters. And he is asking you to feed his sheep. He is asking you to give him your basket. You see, all that matters is what Christ thinks. God uses broken people. Because newsflash, that's the only type of people there are. You are broken. I am broken. The world is broken. But it does not disqualify you. Your mom's broken. Your dad's broken. Your aunt's broken. Your uncles are broken. Your pastors are broken. We are all broken people trying to do what Christ is asking us to do. Do not put any human being on a pedestal. I don't want anybody to ever think for one second just because I'm up here preaching or Matt's up here preaching or Brad, you'll meet Brad in a few weeks because he's up here preaching that we're perfect. That is so far from the truth. We have all lived lies. And a couple of you I know went to high school with me. You know it's true. I see you back there. I see you back there. Don't be divulging any information after church today. <laughs> For real, we're broken people, guys. We're all trying to get this right. 
The key is remembering that you will fail every single time when you do it yourself. You've got to take Christ with you. You have to take Christ to the people that need him. Get out of his way and let him use you. We all have baskets that should be much more full. All of our baskets should be fuller than they are. Let's be, let's be real this morning. We all get lazy. We put a little bit of kindness in our basket. We think that's enough. Yeah, I hug Matt every Sunday. That's enough, God. I've loved people. Our baskets should be much more full. But stop looking into other people's baskets. Stop doing that. Stop looking in, in someone else's basket and telling them how empty theirs is. Because guess what? Yours is as empty, if not more empty, than the persons that you're looking inside of. It's time we stop looking at other people's baskets and stop praying to, start praying to God to fill our own baskets. Fill mine up more, God. Show me how to put more kindness in my basket. The world is full of too many people that look in your basket and tell you how empty it is, how sparse it is. They remind you of your past. They remind you of the time you got arrested, of that DUI, of that drug addiction. They remind you of the rotten fruit in there. Jesus Christ is here to remind you today that there is stuff in there that he needs. He needs it to feed his people. Focus on your own basket. What you have in there is enough for him. As a matter of fact, it's more than enough. We go back to the story of Jesus with the crowd. John chapter 6, verses 12 through 13 says, When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. You see, after Jesus took that young boy's basket that didn't have much in it, he multiplied it. He multiplied it. He took what he needed, and he supernaturally multiplied the goods in that basket. It was insufficient. What that boy had was insufficient. Let's be real for a second. Five loaves and two fish, and you're going to feed 5,000 people with it? You know what? If you're capable of doing that, I want to talk to you after church today because you guys could drastically reduce my grocery bill. <laughs> Sometimes I think my son eats enough for 5,000 people. Honestly, if that boy took that basket and tried to feed those people on his own, impossible. Not going to happen. He would have fed four, five, six people max. But when he handed it to Christ, he leaned on that scripture that tells us with God everything is possible, and Christ moved in that situation, multiplied what that boy had in his basket, and fed 5,000 people with it. And he's going to do the same thing with yours if you'll just give it to him. When we get out of the way and allow Jesus Christ to take what you have lived, to take your life, to take the fruits that you have developed, and we allow him to use those, look out. You will make an impact. Christ will make an impact through you in so many people's lives that you will lose count. And then they'll go out, and they will make an impact in people's lives. And your initial seeds and your initial basket will feed multiples of thousands of people through Christ. It was one boy and one basket. And today, it's one boy and one basket. It's one girl and one basket. It's one man and one basket. It's one woman and one basket. It is you and your basket that will feed thousands of people if you just hand it to Christ. But are we willing to do that? Are we willing this morning to give our basket, just like that boy did, to Jesus Christ? Are you willing to do that? He does not want your loved one stuck in addiction. He does not want your neighbor stuck in sin. He does not want you stuck in adultery. He does not want you stuck in anger. He doesn't want that for you. He wants the freedom that only he offers. You see, for all of us to be sitting in this room right now and to be faithful believers in Christ, at some point, somebody gave their basket to Jesus so he could feed you with it. At some point, somebody said, you know what, Christ, take what I have and feed my mom or feed my dad or feed my neighbor. At some point, somebody made the sacrifice to give what they had to Christ and allow Jesus to feed you. And it's time that we start returning the favor to the other people's in it, people in our lives. It's time we stop being so spiritually greedy and we understand that this world is full of broken people. And listen, if we stop getting broken people in this church, we will have to find a new place to go because when you go into a church, if you go to a church looking for perfection, don't ever attend that church because you will mess it up every time because we're broken. All of us are. 
We took other people's baskets at some time and allowed Jesus to feed us, and then at some point we went into hibernation. We thought, I'm full now, I'm spiritually full. I've got Christ in my life. My wife and kids have Christ in their life. My good friends have Christ in their life. Everyone I go to church with has Christ in our life, in their life. And we have built this community of people around us, and we stopped sharing the gospel at some point. We stopped allowing Christ to use what we had. It's time we realize that we'll never be perfect. It's time we hand Jesus Christ our basket and we allow him to use us. Jesus will turn your little into a lot. It's guaranteed. It happens every single time. Jeff was talking about offering. You know, you start planting seeds, spiritual seeds in people's lives. God will show up every single time. Not because I'm telling you that. Not because Matt will preach that, not because Brad will preach that, because this right here, the Bible tells us that that will happen. This has been tried and trusted for centuries, and what this says you will do through him, what this says Jesus Christ will use you to do, he will use you to do every single time. God wants to multiply what you've got. I hope this morning you can find the courage to hand your basket to Jesus and let him use it. Your family needs it. Your parents need it. Your siblings need it. Your kids need it. Your neighborhood needs it. Your state needs it. The world needs more baskets with fruit in it, church. They need more. You turn on the news, we're fed a steady diet of negativity, of anger, of hatred, of despair, of loneliness, of crime, of murder. And when you sit down in front of your TV every night and that's all you're eating, when that's all you're consuming, your basket starts to get pretty full with that nasty fruit. And when we allow those people around us to just sit at the buffet of negativity and just gorge themselves on that, you are what you eat, church. You are what you eat, and it's time we start introducing then to some new food groups, the fruits of the Spirit, and you do that by living your life in a righteous way. You do that by introducing them to your Savior. This morning, if you find yourself surrounded by a group of believers, right now you find yourself in that group of believers. But don't think for a second that any of us are perfect because we're not. Please, if you are spiritually hungry this morning and you are ready to accept Christ as your Savior, if you are ready this morning to tell Jesus Christ, God, I've tried this too long on my own, I am going to give you my basket this morning. Come up to the altar after this message. At Family Worship Center, you see this altar. Sure, you come and listen to a sermon. You come and listen to some great worship music. But the most important thing that happens in this building or at any Family Worship Center campus, the most important thing that happens is your individual conversations with Christ. That is more important than anything you will hear from this stage. That is more important than any song that will ever be played in this building. And it is our desire to do what Jesus is asking us to do. It is our desire to help you with your conversations with Christ so that you can go out and help other people with their conversations. And if this morning is the morning that you have decided I'm going to hand my basket over to Christ, we would be more than happy. Me and Pastor Matt will be up here. Some of the elders will be up here. We would be more than happy to pray for you and to pray with you. This morning, it's time to make a decision. Are you going to keep carrying your basket around and letting Satan convince you that there's not enough in there? Are you going to be like the disciples? Are you going to tell Jesus, nope, this guy's too broken. It's going to take too many wages. It's going to take me half a year to bring him into a relationship with you. Are you going to continue making excuses or are you going to do what the young boy did? Are you going to say, here's my basket, take it to Christ? Here's my basket. Use what is in here. I want to warn you, when you do that, when you decide to give your basket to Christ, it does not make you perfect. You are not immediately going to become perfect. That will never happen. 
There will be people in your life that remind you how empty that basket you just gave to Jesus. They will remind you every single day how empty and broken your basket was. But you notice when Christ took that basket from Andrew, he didn't look in there and say, oh my gosh, you're right. There's nothing in here. He didn't say that. He gave thanks for what the boy had given him. He told his father, God, thank you, Lord, for this food. Thank you for this basket. Thank you for this young boy that stood up and said, what I have is enough for the Savior to use. And God multiplied that. The boy was young. Scripture tells us he was young. If you're sitting out here this morning and you're young, you're a teenager, you're a preteen, don't wait for the adults in your life to hand their basket to Christ. If they're not willing to do it, what you have in your basket, regardless of age, is enough. I don't care how young or how old you are. He wants what's in the basket. He doesn't need you. He wants you. There's millions of baskets around. What an honor it is for Jesus Christ to ask me for my basket, even though there's nasty stuff in it. What an honor it is for Christ to ask you to give him your basket. Stop being ashamed of what's in there, guys. It's time that we start looking at our basket and doing what Christ did. Thank you, God, for what's in my basket. Thank you for the fruits that I do have. Because when we do that, God does the exact same thing he did for Christ. He multiplies it. And then before you know it, when you hand your basket to Jesus, now you do have love in there. You do have compassion. You do have self-control. All the ingredients that you were once missing are now represented in your basket. But you will not do it on your own. You will not do it by watching the news. You will not do it by reading the newspaper. You will do it by praying to God and relying on Christ to multiply what is in there. As we close the message this morning, I want to encourage a lot of you. There's a lot of new faces in here today. There are some familiar faces as well, but there are a lot of new faces in here. And I want to let you know something on behalf of all three of us pastors, on behalf of all of our elders, on behalf of the Family Worship Center congregation. This is a place where it is okay to be broken. We do not expect you to walk in here with a basket that's overflowing. We do not expect that. We expect to see rotten fruit in there. There's rotten fruit in my basket. There's rotten fruit in Matt's basket. There's rotten fruit in everyone's basket. Our baskets can be much more full than they are. But I want to tell you, do not allow the level of your inventory in that basket to keep you from walking through these doors or the doors in Mattoon or any door that connects you with Christ. Do not allow the world to convince you to do that because when you do that, you become all of a sudden one of the people in the crowd. You see, the crowd was hungry. They didn't have that relationship with Christ yet. We do. But if we don't nurture that relationship, if we don't talk to Christ on a daily basis, if we don't surround ourselves with a body of believers that will love us and help to feed us when we're hungry, you will very quickly find you on yourself on the other side of that story. You will be one of the people that are relying on someone else to give their basket up for. And we've already been through that phase. Don't put yourself back over on that other side. Start taking your own basket. You can do this. Christ can do this through you. This morning, it's time that we get real with each other. We stop looking at our neighbor's basket and we start praying for God to use the basket that we hold in our own hands. God, I thank you so much for this word. Lord, everything you're doing at Family Worship Center, God, the campus, the New Charleston campus, the believers, Lord, that you're bringing here, God, we ask that you use us as a vessel to minister to Charleston and the surrounding communities, God. Lord, we pray that you give us the courage, Lord, the strength to hand you our basket. God, we ask for your forgiveness that has taken some of us so long to do that, God. We ask that you ease our mind, Lord, and you show us that there's nothing to be ashamed of that it doesn't matter how much life we've lived, that it doesn't matter how hard life has been on us, God, that you will take our basket and that you will feed the people around us that need to hear the message of your son, Jesus Christ. 
God, I pray that this altar becomes a place of salvation right here in Charleston, God. That we have people that walk through these doors that have never met your son, God, that decide for the first time, I'm here and I want to know Christ. God, I thank you for everything you're doing. I just pray, Lord, that you continue to bless everyone in this room, Lord, and allow us to be a blessing to someone else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.